We're starting off in our opening segment here. It's a two-parter. We're starting off with FDH Lounge dignitary Kyle Ross on the phone lines here, a, uh, our, our resident pro wrestling analyst and uh, one-time pro wrestling host on this here Sports Talk Network. So we're going to be bringing in Kyle in a second. After that, Alex Marvez from Fox Sports coming in to opine as well, the common denominator tonight. The very sad passing of the macho man, Randy Savage. And uh, this segment here, uh, all I can say is, hearkening back to uh, last week's episode of Parks and Rec, I'm going to quote the uh, incomparable uh, Jean Raphael from the show there, who uh, I know Kyle would hate because he's a hipster, when they were doing the tribute to Lil Sebastian. And he said, I hope you brought a change of clothes because your eyes are going to get ready to piss tears. And having said that, we'll go to our Randy Savage tribute with Kyle Ross. How you doing, my man? Wow, I can only hope I can live up to that wonderful introduction you just gave me. What, the, you know, who would have thought 30 years in, Rick, that I could have the moniker Pro Wrestling Analyst? I'll tell you what, mom and dad must be so proud. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if if, if your parents uh, were to hear that, they'd probably roll their eyes the same as mine. <laughs> what did I send yeah, you to college for? Doing it for the last 20 something years, but that's okay. I'm here and uh, you're fired up as always to talk to you, Ricky. Always a pleasure. Well, it is, it is. I wish it were under better circumstances. Actually, episode 150, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, we're bringing in a lot of the dignitaries to hit so many different topics that night you'll be on to talk pro wrestling then that was already regularly scheduled we uh we, we we freed up some time here tonight to do this you had the very great idea to come on and talk about randy savage and this is one of these things where i'm looking all around uh, the web here i'm looking on message boards and everything and it's one of these things where it seems like he really was the epitome of pro wrestling. I mean, such that, I mean, you look at guys like Hogan, Flair, Piper, that they aren't. This appears to be the universal thing. Everybody universally everywhere who ever liked pro wrestling is upset about this in a way that they wouldn't be if it were one of the other guys I named or even any of the other uh, legends that we think of. Well, you know what's so interesting to me about this whole thing, Ricky, and those who are kind of inside the bubble and look close to the thing, and by the thing I mean wrestling, I think it's more shocking to them than it is to people who maybe haven't watched since the time period where Randy Savage was the man and his apex in the late 80s. It's amazing, and I was talking about this with somebody, how many wrestlers passing would make the front page of ESPN.com. The list is very short of guys mm-hmm. who are left. I mean, you've got your obvious guys, your Hogan, your Austin, you know, Rock is obviously in good health, and, and, you know, heaven forbid that wouldn't happen for a long time. But, you know, it's a real short list, and it kind of caught me off guard in a way how celebrated and, you know, you hesitate to celebrate with something like this, but how celebrated his legacy really was by the public at large. I mean, you're all over the social networks, Ricky, the Facebook, the Twitters, and whatever, mm-hmm. and have you like that. And it was, it really kind of surprised me in a good way, you know, how, how you know, how much um, comments there were uh, about the past in the rainy days. And it makes you wonder, you know, why be surprised? Because, I mean, you're talking about a guy, Ricky, I don't need to tell you, probably the number two performer in that company in the 1980s, you know, obviously behind Hulk Hogan, you know, from 87, 89, it's indisputable. Um, And he probably throughout that whole boom period is probably number two. And it goes back to, and this is weird that his legacy by the company over, you know, you got to remember, he didn't come back, you know, when they bought the company, when they bought WCW in 2001, his legacy had sort of, kind of gone into oblivion with the company, you know, for whatever reason, he's not in the Hall of Fame, you know, for whatever reason, they made a DVD about him, but there was no documentary. So that really caught me by surprise. I, were you the same way, or, or, or am I crazy here? No, I, I think you're uh, you're right about that, and, and I'll tell you what, it's one of these things also, too, didn't stop to think about this until, again, after it happened. So many things don't hit you until you have a chance to think about it. But if you were to look at any of the performers uh, in, in the history of the business, and, and it's weird that you, guys like me and you haven't done this before, Kyle, because you and I are real list of lists type creatures, as we've proven previously here. Mm-hmm. But if, if you line them up one through ten in any number of, of categories, uh, promos, work rate, general charisma, money drawing, it's one of these things where 
He's going to come closer to being 10 out of 10. He's not going to be 10 out of 10 in all of them, but he's going to be closer to 10 out of 10 in most than most of the guys in the history of the business. And he's so larger than life, it's hard to quantify him in, in a single statement. But if you were to try, I think that's where you would start. The across-the-board excellence in a way that, for example, a guy like Hulk Hogan, who's going to be like a, a three on the work rate scale at best, sure. somebody, like, uh, somebody like Flair, who's going to come close in a lot of areas, but uh, if we were to put in, say, the aerial, if we were to separate the aerial things out from the other parts of the work rate, Ric Flair was never great at that. Randy Savage, if not the greatest all-around performer, has got to be on a very short list. Yeah, he really was. And like I said, you know, it's kind of, it's sad, you know, this part of, that, that that was kind of, you know, seemingly for those real close to the vast, real close industry. And seemingly forgot about because he hadn't been around, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you're talking about a guy, and I remember, Ricky, the last time I was, you know, with the show, we, you know, we kind of went over that top 50 list you did. And I thought about that the last couple of days, and you don't want to be prisoner of the moment, but you wondered, did we have him a little too low? Now, obviously, your main criterion with that was money drawing. Sure. But, you know, if you talk to, you know, once again, that average wrestling fan, you know, the guy who only watched Saturday Night's Main Event or whatever. And we John Q. Walmart. That, Randy, you know, Randy Savage is always going to be your short list uh, of, you know, most memorable performers. Certainly from that era, like I said, he, he's number two. I, I would have him number two behind Hulk Hogan. And, you know, that's quite the accomplishment. When you think about it, here's a guy, Ricky, 84 to 1990, he was the only guy besides Hogan who, held the, who got a run with the title. You know, I mean, uh, Andre the Giant, he's some hipster out there. We'll move the Giant at it for two days. Well, we're going to forget about that for now. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he was the only guy, other than Hogan, who got a run. That's a real big mark in the favor. And you're right, all around, it, he was just really one of those guys that it just didn't matter what he was doing. He just did it very well. I mean, whether he was a baby face or a heel, he was, he was one of those guys who you think, oh, which, which role was he better in? And I don't know if I have an answer to that question. I mean, he was just very good in both. Um, and another thing that you have to remember when I look back at his career is just how good he was right off the bat. And, and it's very hard for someone who wasn't around or watching them to kind of conceptualize how he just kind of came in. And, and you know, now we always hear about guys having to work the WWE style, Ricky. I mean, you, you know this. You know, CM Punk's got to learn the WWE style. Stephen Connor has got to learn the WWE stuff. Randy Savage kind of came in, and, and granted it was a different era then with territories and whatnot, and he was very good before he even came to the WWF. But when he did, I mean, he was at a much higher level than, you know, 98% of the people that they had on, the, uh, on that roster at the time. And he kind of came in and was allowed to do his thing, which is pretty shocking when you consider the history of the Vince McMahon Jr., run WWF and now WWE. They don't do that for a lot of guys. I was trying to think of, you know, for a younger fan, any kind of comparison. And I couldn't, I mean, the only thing I could think of is, you know, say five years ago, had they signed Samoa Joe and let Samoa Joe, I mean, he's a different kind of wrestler, but I'm just saying a guy who brings a much different style than everyone, and had they signed him and let him do his thing, which obviously, you know, never happened, never will. But it was just so odd, like how good he or It wasn't odd. It was just such a mark to his favor, just how different he was right off the rip, how good he was right off the rip, and, you know, how they let him kind of be him, and it worked out to his betterment. Well, uh, two last thoughts uh, here, uh, Kyle, because we got a jet to get Alex Marvez, and I just want you to, to, to give me your, your thoughts on, on, on these here. One being that uh, – he w- he was cartoonish if you looked up the definition of it, but people loved it, and people were like, "Damn it, that's pro wrestling!" And even if I think it's cheesy what he just said or how he just said it, "Damn it, that's pro wrestling." So that's the one thing uh, there that, that that I would have to say about that. And then uh, the other thing in, in closing is is just. The way that he he came across, he really was the first cool heel, it seems like. If you go back to 1985 and when he debuted, Mm -hmm. it seems like he was a forerunner with that. Yeah, I put him in, in Roddy Piper would be another guy. Piper, that yeah. Piper. So, I mean, that was an era. Now, you know, we're so accustomed to a heel getting really over and then, you know, the smart marks whatever cheering for him and then he eventually turned babyface. You know, him and Piper were kind of the first two instances that when Randy Savage really, he didn't do anything at the time. And you're looking at the summer of 87 when they turned him face, 
you know, they, you know, he, people were already cheering him. I mean, people were cheering him in the match with Steamboat at WrestleMania three. You mm-hmm. remember, he, he was just one of those guys who was celebrated. And this was, you know, now we we cheer guys because you know they work well in the ring. But he was kind of way ahead of his time with that. And um, you know, he was a guy who was celebrated. I mean, you knew it was him and Steamboat, which is why that feud worked so well in that time period. Him and Steamboat were so far above the rest of that roster in, in terms of in-ring workmanship, and that helped him get over and, you know, helped him stay over for a very long time. I mean, here's a guy, one of the few guys in WCW that ever put somebody over, you know, used his son. I mean, you know, I mean, you look at the other guys at his level, Hogan and Nash, I mean, they didn't do anything like that. He, you know, I think his WCW career, when you look at it, is probably best remembered for how he helped elevate DDP. Yeah, yeah, and uh, D- DDP, who, by the way, glommed onto a TMZ web show the day that this came out. Oh, my uh, God. Good, good to see the the self promotional spirit lives on in true pro wrestling fashion. But uh, Kyle, always a pleasure talking the graps and any other number of things with you, pal. And we're going to get you back on uh, the next episode as well, the Big One Fifty. Okay, I look forward to it, Ricky. Thanks, pal. Appreciate it. Our good friend Kyle Ross, who epitomizes all that is good about the FDH Lounge, I dare say. So, a pleasure talking to our in-house guy on the subject here, somebody who, as I said. A previous longtime pro wrestling analyst here on the Sports Talk Network, and it's uh, going to be great additionally to bring on with our next segment here, uh, Alex Marvez from Fox Sports, a uh, columnist who uh, has covered any number of different uh, fields. MMA, although my, my understanding is he's not covering as much uh, MMA at the moment. Pro football, he was actually uh, past uh, president of the Pro Football Writers Association of America, uh, so a, a longtime uh, correspondent, somebody who actually uh, has covered, among other things, up close, my Miami Dolphins. As I've said previously on the show, they're my 1A team uh, in football, the Browns being my one, of course, my hometown team. But uh, I- I've seen Alex's writing for a long time on the subject of the Miami Dolphins, as well as uh, the NFL as a whole on Fox Sports. And of course, uh, his work over a period of time with the Pro Wrestling Observer, uh, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, I should say, uh, we actually have done the clean sweep of the major personalities from there, having had on now Brian Alvarez, Dave Meltzer, and uh, Alex Marvez, who was the first of the three who had been on uh, with us. So we uh, we were very uh, pleased to be able to get him on the program. It was about two years ago at this time when we had him on, and it was uh, it was a true pleasure uh, to speak with him. We didn't speak to him as much on the subject of pro wrestling at that time. We hit a couple of different subjects. I think we talked some MMA. Ironically, we were already looking ahead about two years ago, just a shade over two years ago, to the NFL lockout, which is now upon us. That just proves how long and coming uh, this ordeal has been. So I do want to sneak in a question or two towards the back end here on the subject of the NFL lockout, which I know that he's covering uh, very much. But the main thing we're going to be speaking with uh, him tonight uh, will be regarding his column on Macho Man Randy Savage on FoxSports.com and uh, additionally his remembrances of him, his coverage of him uh, during his uh, journalistic career. Uh, And as somebody who is a a long-time uh, writer on the subject of pro wrestling and having been affiliated with the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which, uh, with apologies to any of the other uh, publications out there, is is commonly regarded as, as being uh, the greatest and uh, the most credible. It certainly is the forerunner in the industry. It goes back the furthest. Uh, Dave Meltzer really is the godfather of the industry, and uh, the, the, the people that he associates with are of necessity of a first-rate nature. That, of course, encompasses uh, Brian Ryan Alvarez and Alex Marvez, as I say, both of whom we've been privileged to get on previously. So it, uh, it's great to have been able to have uh, gone through uh, all of them. Alex was actually the first one we had on, as I said, about two years ago. Subsequently, we've been fortunate enough to talk to Brian Alvarez and uh, Dave Meltzer about that. Uh, this is the show where nothing is off topic, of course, but uh, one of the things we've always had a soft spot for, among other things, is pro wrestling. Uh, we're, we're, we're probably one of the only shows out there that's not wrestling specific as far as the focus but where we do like to talk about it and on a sad occasion such as this with the passing of randy savage we want to commemorate that also celebrate a great career and as i said who better to do that than alex marvez it's a pleasure to have him on alex welcome back to the fdh lounge sir it's a pleasure to have you on tonight Hey, thanks for having me back on. Do appreciate it. Oh, it's uh, it's great to have you. Uh, the the circumstances are are, are sad, of course. Uh, the passing of 
uh, Randy Savage. Uh, just prior to when you came on, we talked to uh, one of one of our in-house uh, pro wrestling analysts here, and we were kind of bantering about that for a little bit and just observing the outpouring in the last couple of days. And the thing that's really been striking to me and looking at the message boards and, and, and other measures out there, social media and everything else, would be, I'm not sure that there's a passing of any other one individual where there would be an outpouring like this, of where you wouldn't have some fans that would be like, eh, I don't know how much I like that guy. You might get even a little bit of that with Piper, Flair. God knows you'll get it with Hogan. He's more of a divisive figure the longer he goes along, et cetera. Out of all the icons, would we react to anybody else the way that everybody's reacting to Randy Savage? No, and it's a very interesting response. And, you know, look, as a performer, I have all the respect in the world for Randy Savage. This guy came along at the right time with the right gimmick and had the skills in the ring to go ahead and be an absolute success. I mean, it was funny. I watched about 12 minutes of old Randy Savage promos this morning when I was reading an article on him on Deadspin.com. And it was just amazing how the guy would go ahead and bring little props to his interviews. You know, he'd bring a little coffee creamer saying that he's a cream of pro wrestling. You know, back when you were allowed to say pro wrestling on WWE. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, they brought out a broom, how he was going to sweep away the competition. All these little things that made him such a great promo, but the thing was, he could wrestle. I mean, people still to this day talk about his match with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat at WrestleMania three as one of the great matches of all time. The guy, you know, didn't really run into any legal problems. He didn't, he wasn't a polarizing figure in terms of things that he said, and he did not live as welcome. I mean, Randy Savage basically ended his career ten years ago. He's worked one match in the past ten years that nobody really saw back at T. DNA Wrestling in 2004, and that was it for this guy. But, you know, I think as much as anything, he really reflects uh, maybe a, a nostalgia look. You know, you think back to the mid-1980s when so many people, I'm 40 years old, I was 14 at the time, you know, a huge wrestling fan, and to see this guy come to WWE and to be part of the whole WWF expansion at the time, Hulk Hogan, Cindy Lauper, MTV, and all the great memories that this guy had, and the fact that he could wrestle, gosh, it's an amazing thing, but it's so, it's so tearing to me because... In real life, this was one of the worst people when it came to the way that he treated his former wife, Elizabeth Hewlett, mm -hmm. the lovely Elizabeth. It was terrible. Anyone that talks about a match made in heaven and Elizabeth waiting for this guy out there has no idea what it is that they're talking about. He was such an abusive person toward her in real life. The, you know, the, the berry didn't fall far from the tree when it came to Randy Savage, the pro wrestling persona who would always boss her around, and Elizabeth Hewlett in real life, who was so anxious to get out of this relationship that she left all her money behind. She basically fled her house, moved in with the Hogan's for a little bit, then moved to South Florida. I got to know her. I spent some time with her. We had lunch talking about the situation, and a lot of the stuff that was really abusive that Randy Savage did. He would keep track of her car miles to find out if she'd been driving while he was out of town. He used to number the amount of TV dinners that he would have for her each night because they were so frugal. Randy still had the first penny he ever earned. Mm -hmm. He would go ahead and do some things like that uh, that would go ahead and, you know, basically make this woman live a life totally subservient to him. Wouldn't She had to dress in a separate locker room area, had to keep her head down when walking through the locker room, couldn't have contact with people. It was just really sad, and, and that's really, you know, it's sort of one of the things that depresses me a lot about pro wrestling, because I'm not nearly as much of a fan, uh, really as much at all, compared to how I used to be, because now it's like when you know how the hot dog's made, you know, you don't want to eat the sausage, if you understand what I'm saying, yeah. and that's how, unfortunately, I view Randy Savage. The guy was a tremendous performer, provided a lot of happiness for a lot of people, but in real life, left a lot to be desired, unfortunately, especially during his time with Elizabeth Hewlett. Alex, you just put a lot of great material out there because I'll tell you what, uh, the one thing that, I, that came to mind when, when you were talking about this was uh, a quote that I had heard previously from the Honky Tonk Man where he was saying if, if, if you took him to the Mid-Hudson Civic Center, he could show you the room that Randy Savage had her locked in during the shows. So I'm um, flashing back to that. But then in, in terms of how we're relating to him, I'm seeing a lot of commonalities here. We, we did a segment on the show two summers ago. We had on a long time a friend of ours, longtime TV columnist Adam Buckman, and we were talking about the Michael Jackson memorial and everything of that. And, and I, I said, I know there's a little bit of a backlash about you know the, this wave that people are feeling and the love and everything. And I said, I don't think, at least speaking for myself, it's not love for Michael Jackson, but it's memories. I, mean, I was a kid when, yeah. when, when Thriller came out, and so many memories of our lives are bound up in that. And you, know, you, you and I are, are, are pretty darn close to the same age, Alex, so we have a lot of the same shared memories and, and everything. Everything. So this this wave of outpouring again, 
again. And, you know, it, maybe, it, maybe it would be better if it was for Randy Poffo, the person, but this wave of outpouring for Randy Savage, I think, it says more about the memories and the shared experiences that, that his, him and his character brought to our lives. Amen about that. It's interesting. Bill Simmons, I believe, wrote a blog today. I've not had a chance to read it, but he talked about how uh, essentially this guy was able to unite so many different people in this past week. You had wrestling fans from back in the mid-1980s who no longer follow the product, but clearly have such incredible memories of things that Randy Savage did. You have people that, that are wrestling fans now that, that you know are still so into the product and love it, longtime fans like that. You even have a newer generation that's been able to watch his matches on DVD. And, and it's interesting now because he had a a personal falling out with Vince McMahon. Uh, there's a lot of speculation and things like that that I really don't care to get into about why this happened. Uh, but the reality is that with Vince, you know, if you think about it, Randy Savage, the fact he's not in their Hall of Fame, uh, you know, it's just so bizarre. But that'll tell you how, the, how deep these roots run as far as the, the basis of their problem. But nonetheless, now I think with Savage passing, you're going to see another wave of nostalgia come forward. And what it's going to allow people to do, too, is allow another generation of fans to see just how good this guy really was. I mean, he could fly through the air. He could technically wrestle. His punches look great. And I'll tell you what, he was a scary guy. You know, it's funny. We talk about Mike the Miz Mizanin, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, hey, look, I think the guy's an entertaining guy, but a lot of people have knocked his, his run as WWE champion. And I think part of it is that he doesn't come across as a tough guy legitimately. If you were in a bar with Mike Mizanin, I think you'd take a swing at him and not think twice if you guys got into some sort of beef over a few beers. Uh, reality is with Randy Savage, this guy was intimidating. He was scary. And he carried that. And it's something that I think so many of today's pro wrestlers lack, that aura of authenticity. Yeah, you knew Randy Savage was participating in a fast sport and the matches were predetermined. You knew what pro wrestling was, but this guy transcended his personality and his character really got you to believe so many things about him. It really was like a roller coaster watching, you know, being on one every time this guy wrestled. Alex, it's interesting to hear you speculate about the, the Miz like that. I can actually confirm that through, through a fluke of uh, uh, fate or whatever. My, my senior producer actually ended up uh, approaching him at uh, the whiskey on the Sunset Strip and uh, drinking beers with him. So the Miz was not somebody that was too scary to approach, at least in that instance. So you're absolutely right about that. Some of these guys you might think twice before going up to them uh, because of the way that they uh, carry themselves. As a matter of fact, about two months ago when we had Dave Meltzer, uh, your, your, your associate on the show here, he even said, that, uh, that that he he thinks that he's he was not a good champion because he was booked as being so unintimidating and you know cowardly heel and everything. So you make a very good point about that. But the way that Savage came across, it's one of these things where I can't imagine anybody else, Piper, Hogan, Flair, anybody that if they did anything that was like cartoonish even for them, it would be like, uh, I like this guy, but I'm going to crap all over what they just did. For Randy Savage, it seems like there was nothing so cartoonish that he could do or say or whatever where you wouldn't just laugh and go, oh, here's the macho man for you. Yeah, you're right about that. And, you know, it takes us back to a time, too, when storylines were so much simpler than what they are now, just basic good versus evil. Think about the most successful storylines that Randy Savage was involved with. You had a wedding that's gone awry because Jake Roberts doesn't get invited to a party. You have jealousy over Elizabeth when Hulk Hogan goes ahead and, and you know, that, that split up the mega powers. You know, you had just things that you could build up for a long period of time. They weren't trying to rush to fit everything in. Everyone kept their character. The stuff made sense. You think the you think last night, you, Monday Night Raw, you know, they have something now in this newcomer, Karma. You know, she's a tremendous performer, so different than all the other performers they have in the female division of WWE as this horrifying monster. And last night, four weeks in, after she's been intimidating anyone, she gets into the middle of the ring and crawls into a ball and starts crying. I mean, it just makes you wonder who's writing this sort of material when you can just continue to portray someone in a certain way to end up having box office success for them. It's one of the things I think that gets frustrating to pro wrestling fans and really makes me take a look back when I look at the booking of Randy Savage, how he was handled. It made perfect sense. The storylines made sense. They took their time. I know it's difficult today. There were only four pay-per-views to promote every year for a while during Randy Savage's heyday as opposed to 12, 13 a year now. But this guy had it. He carried it. He came across as legit. And give him credit, too. He helped elevate people in his career. You think to Diamond Dallas Page and the fact that Page was really a mid-card guy, but Randy Savage was willing to work with him and go ahead and they put on some great matches and it really elevated DDP stock. In a lot of ways, Randy Savage, a consummate professional. In fact, I remember back in Denver when I was living there, 
He had torn his ACL back in the mid-1990s, late 1990s. There was some question whether or not he was going to work a pay-per-view main event. The guy ended up going 20 minutes in the match. I mean, that is outstanding. That shows the commitment that Randy Savage had to his craft. Yeah, yeah, he was he was wonderful at the craft, uh, no question about that. It, it also strikes me in, in looking at his career that uh, it, it is so, it, it's emblematic of where they were and where they've come to because you, you talked about the thing with Carmel last night. I would suspect that's just through throwing a curveball for the sake of throwing a curveball. Nobody will see this coming. My guess is that, like yours, that they probably don't even know, don't know what to do with it at this point, but they wanted to do something different and throw us off track. But Randy Savage, when he came in in 1985, my gosh, that just shows you how, and this is relative for the industry of pro wrestling, but how unscripted it was. They let him come in. They let him get over. He was the original cool heel. Interviews weren't scripted uh, you know, it, precisely the way that they are now. He could go on camera and he could convey his natural essence. I mean, he sort of is emblematic of, of, of where the business was and, and, and what it's come to. And maybe part of the outpouring for him is people looking at it and saying, man, that's when the stuff was really cool. That's when they let the essence of the guys shine through, and today they're all just a bunch of robots. You're so right about that, and I think you raise a great point there with the WWE trying to throw a curveball. There was no reason to throw a curveball when the fastball is working. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying, they had no reason last night to make that type of switch, and, and I think that that's what gets frustrating to wrestling fans. You know, it's interesting. I forwarded a poll to Dave Meltzer with all the stats that have come out now about today's wrestling fans, and you look back for 10 years, and the only real increase in a lot of ways of wrestling fans are people that are earning a very small amount of money. I mean, you're talking about, you know, $20,000 or less, where people that are earning a hundred fifty thousand dollars and over which a lot of people in our generation may fall into that category now have tuned out of pro wrestling if you understand what i mean they're not getting what it is that they loved about it maybe they're they're just tuned out of the genre entirely maybe they turn to mixed martial arts because of the way that they do interviews and it's a much simpler thing a good guy is going to one guy's going to face another guy they have a beef they have a conflict they build it up they know how to build their main events their superstars their guys have their own form of characters mma to me is a little bit of a work like pro wrestling in that you have matchmakers that set matches based on trying to create exciting fights. Not necessarily, you know, there's no ranking system that makes any sort of sense in UFC or anything like that. They become their own form of pro wrestling, but it did take us back to a simpler time in the mid-1980s. And you're right about Savage. Remember, these guys were stuck basically shooting interviews all day. They would go 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or whatever time it was and shoot individualized promos for all the markets that they went to. So it would be Randy Savage coming to West Palm Beach, Florida, Randy Savage going to Birmingham, Alabama, having to pitch different things about those cities and try to keep it fresh, try to keep it creative, and more than anything, try to keep a straight face, which was Savage, was sometimes a little bit hard even for me and Gene to do. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely, and it, it, it's great getting to watch outtakes uh, with, with, you know, and, and you just see how much he had a tendency to uh, crack people up. Uh, can't have you on the show, Alex, and not get into, uh, you know, m- another major field of expertise for you. Uh, the NFL, it's been your beat for an awful long time uh, with, with, with Fox Sports, also with, uh, with, with scripts. Uh, about two years ago on the show, you said, and, and, and I was skeptical, but you were right, that the players would cave on reinstitution of the salary cap uh, once uh, there was an uncapped year, it looks like that's going to be you know somewhere in whatever settlement gets reached. But where we're at right now, uh, the, the the popular meme in the media is that the owners have regained the upper hand, at least as of now, until the next appeal, uh, I guess, is heard or the next hearing on uh, the TV money and what the penalties are going to be there. What's the poop look like from your perspective right now on how long this thing might draw out and, and indeed who might have the upper hand? Yeah, you know, and I'm in Indianapolis right now at the NFL Spring Meetings talking to you. I just listened to Jeff Pash talk for 30 minutes. You know, he's the NFL lead negotiator, their general counsel. And, you know, he's, you know, if the NFL continues to try to beat the same drum, we've got to get back to negotiations, not litigation. But the reality is that litigation is driving this train. So much does depend upon what the circuit court decides uh, when they go ahead and hear the Brady versus NFL appeals about keeping the lockout in place. The NFLPA at this point, or we should say the Brady versus NFL, the plaintiffs, the class counsel must convince one of the three judges on that panel to change their mind because right now there's a two-for-one advantage for the NFL when it comes to keeping the lockout in place. If the lockout remains in place, ultimately the players may cave as the regular season gets closer. Maybe they can hold on for a bit. Maybe they've just decided that, you know what, fundamentally we just cannot agree to going ahead and working with the NFL right now because we're not happy with their deal. The NFL trying to get them back into the negotiating room, but you know what, I just think that that ship has sailed at this time. I 
do think it will come back to port at some point. But what I think we're looking at at best would be early to mid-June, or July rather, early to mid-July, once the Eighth Circuit of Court of Appeals decides whether or not this lockout can be kept in place indefinitely or not, I think at that point we'll go ahead and see what's going on. It, it, is, a, it is a strange one because I, I tell you, I, I'm curious, you know, the lockout is going to cause irreparable harm to players if players do start missing games. I think it's causing irreparable harm in, in a sense to, un, to undrafted college free agents. You think about it, 10 or 11 guys in the NFL Network's top 100 players that they're showing right now we're not drafted. So, and these guys are going to have such a tough time making the team. I, I think that's irreparable harm if you have to miss training camps, preseason, and the like. So I'll be curious to see if the circuit court goes ahead and, and puts a deadline on the NFL, forces them to lift the lockout by a certain date. If that happens, then again negotiations get frozen. This one's ugly. I, I just think that at some point there will be some court ruling down the road that pushes these sides back together in a negotiating room somewhere beside the one that they're doing now, which is mediation in Minneapolis related to a court case. There's certain things that can't be discussed because the NFL, the Brady versus NFL side, the player side, they're suing for things that the NFL wants to get reinstituted. So it's so messy. It's so ugly. It's turning fans off. But where I really think the backlash is going to come in will be in late August. And that's when mainstream fans start to ask, hey, Where's my fantasy team? What's going to be happening with my fantasy team? Because those are the casual types of fans, a lot of folks, that really get a kick out of football then. And if they're going into September and thinking, I'm not going to have a fantasy team, I'm not going to be able to watch football on Sundays, at least for the short term, you're going to have a lot of angry, disenfranchised people. No question about that, uh, Alex. Uh, and uh, as, as they always, you know, as they say in the movie of The Big Lebowski, a lot of ins, a lot of outs. This is a very complex situation. But again, always enjoy following your work on Fox Sports. Uh, and all the other venues as well, uh, scripts, syndication, etc. A true pleasure to have you on, uh, Alex, and uh, we would love to have you back on sometime soon. Oh, yeah. Thank you, baby. Yeah. <laughs> That's going in a promo, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Appreciate it, Alex. Thank you so much. The great Alex Marvez, everybody, from FoxSports.com, Scripps Syndication, uh, et cetera, Sirius XM Radio. The list goes on and on and on. There is only one Alex Marvez. What a great journalist. 